Alright guys, Murph's here, and today we're going to be talking about this, a J.C. Higgins Model 20 12 gauge shotgun, product number 583.56, and we're talking about that more as we go along. Now before we get too far into this, let's talk about some history, because where does J.C. Higgins come from? Well in the 1890s, a man named John Higgins emigrated from Ireland and he started working for Sears and Roebuck here in the United States. Now, Sears and Roebuck is that Sears department store that we know today. However, at this time in the 1890s, they were in way better financial condition than they are today. Now, by 1908, Mr. Higgins had worked himself up to being vice president of Sears and Roebuck. And in that year, a product line of sporting guns was introduced in his name. Now, something to point out first off, is that Mr. Higgins did not actually have a legal middle name. It was a marketing decision that two initials would look better than just one. And in addition to that, it is unclear as to whether or not John Higgins actually had an impact in the sports shooting community. It's unknown if he was an avid hunter or, or marksman or anything like that. I'm pretty sure that when you're the vice president of a company, you get to name the product lines whatever you want to name them. And that's probably why it bears his name. Now, the initial guns in the Sears catalog in 1908 were single shot shotguns and 22s of different types. But they were guns produced for them by high standard with Sears and J.C. Higgins markings on them. And these guns were kind of aimed at the budget market. So they weren't so budget that they were like a lot of the guns available in hardware stores at the time, which were kind of cheap, no-name brand, double barrel shotguns and, and things of that nature. But they were not nearly as expensive as Winchester or Remington offerings at the time. Now, by 1948, the product line expanded a little bit and it introduced the Model 20 pump action shotgun as well as uh, not too much longer before it had a couple of semi-automatic shotgun offerings in it as well. Now there's a little bit of a debate about the genesis of this shotgun. Some people say that the high standard Model 200 came out first and then high standard started producing the Model 20 for Sears and Roebuck. Other people say that high standard produced the Model 20 for Sears and Roebuck first and then came out with a Model 200 branded shotgun for themselves. I don't think it matters either way. We're not having a patent conversation right now. There's no money involved in it. Just chicken or egg, it doesn't really matter. So, these guns come out. They do pretty well on the market. They are competitively priced, and they continue to be produced until 1962 when the Ted Williams catalog takes over. Now, you run into a lot of issues trying to track down the models and stuff like that because there are there are parts compatibilities across Ted Williams, J.C. Higgins, and in conjunction with Sears, or excuse me, with high standard shotguns, but it's very difficult to track down for reasons we'll discuss here after a bit. Now, let's talk about this shotgun specifically. So, starting at this end, we have a muzzle device. Now a lot of people have incorrectly called this a suppressor. It is most definitely not. What it is is a poly choke. Now this gun was built with both poly choke and uh, fixed choke barrels available. There we go. And at this time it's pretty uncommon to have interchangeable choke tubes. In vector and rem choke choke tubes don't exist yet. So either you have a fixed barrel and that's the, that's the choke that you have pretty much all the time, you know, modified, full, whatever it may be, that's what you got. Or you went and you got a poly choke. This is uh, what J.C. Higgins called their power pack poly choke. And what it is was it was three different choke tubes that could be inserted into this muzzle device. You had a short, medium, and long range choke tube. This is the medium, which correlates to modified. The short is improved cylinder, and the 
long range is full. Now, I, it does go to say that these choke tubes are actually very tightly choked. Um, I've found that I've been able to make some pretty long shots on birds beyond what I would expect I would be able to do with a modified choke. It's almost like a, a, a light full, if that makes any sense. It probably doesn't, but just, just bear with me here. Now, you'll also notice that this has some ports cut into it, and that is because this has a compensating type effect. Now, this is a seven or eight pound shotgun. It's quite bulky, and by weight, it does really help soak up the recoil of 12 gauge. However, this does make it even more enjoyable to shoot. Now, if you look at this size comparison here, you will notice that the end, the actual end of the barrel and the beginning of the choke tube has a little bit of space in between it. Now this has caused a lot of debate on what type of ammunition you can fire in these shotguns. I have been shooting these for 20 years and I have entirely shot bird shot through them, be it either target loads or hunting loads. And I have never once had an issue with this choke tube. The extent of issues I've had with this poly choke setup uh, were actually captured in some of the range footage that I shot. I'll, I'll cut that in right now. All right guys, so there's some of the plastic wadding in the power pack. As you can see, it is well clear of being any type of bore obstruction. All right, so as you can see, and actually I pulled them out in cleaning, these plastic shavings were just caught between the choke tube and the muzzle device itself, the outer housing of the muzzle device. In no way do they constitute a bore obstruction. In addition to that, in later shooting that I've done, I've not had that be an issue. I've not had a plastic buildup from the shot wads going out. So I don't know what causes it. It seems to be different across different types of ammunition. Overall, I've not found it to be an issue and I wouldn't expect it to be an issue. Now, that dynamic changes a little bit when you talk about slugs and buckshot. And for myself, with Shotguns that I have, I have never run slugs and buckshot through this gun, and I never intend to run slugs and buckshot through this gun. I've got other guns I can do that out of. I don't need to do it in this one. If you want to do that, to each their own, let me know how it works out. Now, coming back to here, we have a 26-inch barrel, four inches of which are taken up by this power pack muzzle device. On top of the barrel and the muzzle device, we have two beads, which um, some people seem to really like that for a sight picture. I have never been that dead set on sight pictures when it comes to wing shooting. I always just focus on the front bead whenever it comes to wing shooting, so it's neither here nor there for me. It does sit on top of a vent rib barrel, which of course has serrations cut into it so that uh, it doesn't pick up light and all that kind of stuff, reflect it back at you. These barrels are not proof for steel. Based on when these were produced, they actually predate the laws that require us to use steel shot for waterfowl hunting, so it is not recommended that you run steel shot through these guns. You can, however, run heavy shot or bismuth if you were really dead set on taking this out into a uh, duck blind. Now, coming back to our slide here, you'll see that we have a single action bar, which is kind of a reliability miss. Um, double slide bars were a thing, double action bars were a thing by the time the shotgun was produced and it is a better design from a reliability standpoint. However, having said that, I have never had any reliability issues with this gun that were not shooter, in shooter induced, which I actually have a little bit of footage of that. And you can tell that that's shooter induced because it only happens whenever I come down off of target and I'm just getting the next shell up ready to go. So that's that's purely just me not not moving the slide fast enough or too you know too fast, whatever it may be. Now this is a five shot shotgun, and it is chambered for two and three quarter inch or shorter shells. This actually predate, predates three inch shells as well. You can find these guns in 12, 16, and 20 gauge. The vast majority of the ones I see are in 12 gauge. 
Uh, I have run across 20 gauge guns. I don't think I've seen a 16 gauge chambered Model 20 yet. Now, a couple of interesting things about this gun. I mentioned before the 583.56. And this is where production things kind of get weird. So the 583 indicates the JC Higgins product line. After that, I'm not really sure what it means. I'm pretty sure that the 5 indicates a polychoke barrel, but I'm not entirely sure what the 6 indicates. I think it indicates a jeweled bolt and lifter, which I have, as well as the aluminum shield set into the stock so that you can engrave your initials. But I don't know that. And I don't know that because it is extremely difficult to track down all these product details. It's very difficult to do in sporting guns as it is, because you run into a lot of uh, manufacturer exclusives or or retailer exclusive type models, limited runs for different types of, of events and stuff like that. Or in general, when you're talking about pre the 1968 Gun Control Act, which the J.C. Higgins shotguns definitely are, you're talking about not even having to have serial numbers on the guns. J.C. Higgins produced shotguns do not have serial numbers. Previous to 1968, nothing made a manufacturer have serial numbers on their guns, so that was extremely common on budget shotguns and rifles and all, the whole works, 22s, all of those guns. It was very common for them not to have serial numbers. Now, your Remingtons and Winchesters and stuff like that, they had serialized manufacturers so that they could track batches and lots, so they could know if they had a heat treatment issue and how many serial numbers and production numbers it may affect and manufacturing issues, all that kind of stuff. You don't have that with the J.C. Higgins guns, so it makes it very difficult to track down parts and all that kind of stuff for the guns. It's, it's a nightmare. A lot of the information that you get about these guns is out of forums, and I find forums to be extremely sketchy, especially if somebody cannot refer me to either a catalog or a manual. Now, some other interesting features we have on this shotgun include a magazine cutoff on this side of the gun. Now, this is not the magazine cutoff that a lot of your World War I aficionados are used to, where I'm single loading shotgun shells if I'm taking shots at solitary ducks and then I can flip the, the switch over if I get bum rushed by a bunch of ducks so that I have more shots on board. This is actually set up as a safety feature for being out in the field. So let's say that you're about to cross a fence in a hunting type scenario and you're doing a thing that savvy hunters do, which is unloading your shotgun. Well, instead of having to open the slide and then extract two shells because one's gonna be on the lifter and one was in the chamber, you can just turn on your magazine cutoff, eject the round of the chamber, set the shotgun on the, on the other side, cross the fence, and then get back into action. Or, if you're done hunting that field, but you're going to go hit another field, you can hit that magazine cutoff, eject the round of the chamber, throw it in the trunk, go to your next location. It's a pretty handy feature, and I actually kind of wish it would make a comeback. Now, our safety on this gun is a push, uh, push cross bolt in front of the trigger guard, which is my favorite location. It allows for a very natural transition to the trigger after disengaging the safety. And our slide release is at the rear of the shotgun, which is also my favorite location. Um, it's, just, it's a very natural progression to be able to work with this gun with those things in, that, in those spots. Now, another interesting thing to talk about that's specific to these older style of shotguns is that this shotgun does not have an interrupter switch. So what does that mean? Well, that means that it's capable of slam firing. Well, what's slam fire? So. I can have this shotgun fully loaded up, and let's say that I really want to hit something with a bunch of shot. I do not have to release the trigger in between shots as I cycle the gun. I can bring it up, and I can hit that release, and then I can hold the trigger, as you can see there, as it cycles, the firing pin will automatically go home into the, in, into the shell in the chamber. So you can rapid fire the shotgun in that way. A lot of people make a big deal out of this type of thing. I've never found it to be all that advantageous and I, I don't think I've ever slam fired on a range actually. It's, it's not actually very helpful. 
Now, looking at the overall construction of this shotgun, it is extremely high quality with one caveat. Now, this is all steel and we're talking about a lot of milling. It's not stamped. All of this is milled forged steel which shows a very high degree of man hours put into each shotgun. I'm pretty sure that if this shotgun was produced today with its same feature sets with maybe some interchangeable barrels, that would be pretty nice. This would be worth more than a Remington 870. Now, speaking about interchangeable barrels, it's one of the big flaws with this shotgun. This barrel is not interchangeable. It is a fixed barrel. It's installed just like a rifle barrel is. And that's a huge miss on today's market. In order to get a new barrel on this gun, you would have to take it to a gunsmith, have the barrel uninstalled and reinstalled, and it would probably wind up costing more than you have in the gun, which is unfortunate. In addition to the fact, with the you know cross-reference of parts and all that kind of stuff, you may have some issues trying to find a barrel for this gun. I would really implore you to do your research and make sure you're getting the right barrel to drop into this. Now, another little caveat with construction of this shotgun is this trigger pack. Now this is all high quality blued steel. This trigger pack is made of like pot metal, which is really unfortunate because it's a very critical part that breaks quite frequently in these guns. There are two ears at the leading edge of this trigger pack that you have to pivot against as you reinsert it into the shotgun after disassembly. And it's pretty common for those to break off, which is kind of an issue because then you, your trigger pack is just going to keep falling out of the gun. In addition to that, the springs and the pins inside will break. Every time I disassemble this shotgun, I spend a lot of time looking through the parts and pieces, making sure that everything is up to spec. Now, we have this nice wood on this shotgun as well. It's very high quality. It's far better than what you'll find on your modern production Mossberg 500s. I absolutely hate that wood. And here on the butt, we have a nice rubber butt pad. Depending on the age and condition of some of these shotguns, these could have completely dry rotted into uselessness. However, this one's in good shape. Now, talking about track record and all this kind of stuff, this gun was marketed to budget-minded people. And a lot of these guns have been used and abused and are in pretty terrible disrepair. Even a sterling example of this shotgun is probably not going to be, is not going to fetch much more than $200. These are extremely inexpensive to get into, which is actually kind of nice because it is still a very good shotgun overall. If you take a couple of things into consideration, you can actually make it a little bit better and tailored to your tastes, but it depends on how much you want to spend on them. But when it comes to parts, that's a big issue because these guns are known to break and there are no new parts being produced for them. So pretty much the only way to get parts is to buy yourself a donor shotgun. Now you can find a lot of these guns for under $100. They'll be in pretty rough shape, but there might be some parts that you can use off of it. So you spend 80 bucks on a donor shotgun to keep next to your working shotgun so that hopefully you can keep your working shotgun in a working condition. Now what do I use this shotgun for? Well, I have put hundreds if not thousands of rounds through these shotguns on trap days. Uh, when I was growing up as a kid, I used them a lot for hunting pheasant and stuff like that. This was my go-to pheasant shotgun. And I presently use it for home defense because it is a reliable and smooth operating shotgun. I, I really love this action. I don't know if they were this smooth when they were first produced, but after 60 years of use, it is definitely, definitely well broken in and very smooth to operate. And on pretty much all the shotguns that I've handled, I've noticed that they are that smooth and easy to operate. Now, what might you use this for? Well, the sky's the limit in a lot of respects. When you consider that you can pick these up all day between $120 and $150, you could, do, you could afford to do a lot of customization to the shotgun if you felt like it. Let's say you got one with the power pack and you just, it's not going to be useful to you. Well, assuming you know how to measure legal barrel length, you could hack this down to 18 inches and have yourself a extremely budget home defense shotgun. That would work. If you don't know how to measure legal barrel length though, I'd suggest you take it to a gunsmith. 
if you wanted to keep this in the back of your truck working out on the farm or something like that to be able to take pot shots at some varmints or or whatever you know maybe just plink around a little bit while you're out working this shotgun will do it and it'll do it really well this is also an interesting collector's item as i was doing my research for this video i found that there are you know a lot of people who collect out there which shouldn't be a shock to me my my father is actually a collector of these shotguns and i've definitely noticed that the average age of the collector seems to be above 45 but when you consider how inexpensive and quality these guns are this is actually a lot cheaper to try to collect than say mausers or something like that but guys i think that pretty much covers my thoughts on this shotgun uh, I think I'll send us out a little bit of uh, shooting footage, so have a good day. Oh. 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 Salazar Slither. Nope, nothing. Pull. Salazar Slither. Oh, it worked that time. You had to select something. Your mama. Still working. Yep, yep. Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg. There we go. Sally. I think I'm out. Yep, I'm out. <laughs> 